you are very happy to have the uh, country from so, another teacher tell us about long term uh, group outreach over the hours. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation and for coming. Is this thing on? The, yeah, you, you said it was on. Great. All right. The a problem which motivated pretty much the project that this talk is based on is counting BPS states. In string theory on a Calabi L3 fold. And the Calabi L3 fold, I mean, three fold is pretty clear, complex dimension three. The Calabi L condition for the purpose of this talk just refers to the fact that the canonical class of this three fold is trivial. So trivial sheaf, canonical sheaf. That's what being Calabiyao means. Uh, I'm obviously not, not going to solve this problem in this generality. I'm, you know, arguably I'm not really solving anything because this count was actually done for toric Calabiyao three folds by introducing a um, procedure called crystal melting. And this also motivates lots of the objects which I will talk about in this talk. But maybe I should actually point out from the onset that the kind of geometry which I'm interested in is not general Calabi L3 folds, but toric Calabi L3 folds. And through a procedure that I won't necessarily detail, but I will ask people to take on faith, a toric Calabi L3 fold is encoded by a quiver. And this is actually what this talk will be about, about quivers. So this will be encoded by a quiver. Let's call it Q with face drawn on the torus with faces colored in two colors, uh, with faces colored in blue and red. Now, the way to go from a Calabiao threefold, a Tore Calabiao threefold to this quiver has been known to physicists for 20 something years. I'm not going to be able to detail it now. You take this thing, you write it, historic diagram, you draw what people call a brain tiling, and then the brain tiling gives rise to a quiver. So, you know, this thing I, uh, I'm going to leave in the background, but I'm going to show you some pictures. So these are going to be the running examples in this talk. <laughs> no, it wasn't here. <laughs> uh, the, a fundamental example of a Tori Calabia threefold is C3, and it corresponds to this quiver on a torus. So this is a quiver on the torus with one vertex. I mean, this is all one in the same vertex because it's you know, on, on the torus and three edges. So this, these two are the same edge. These two are the same edge and the diagonal is an edge. And the two faces, the blue and the red one are as in this picture. So you have one vertex, three edges and two faces, which is good because one minus three plus two is zero. And namely, this thing is drawn on the torus. The condition with the blue and the red faces for these quivers is that all of the arrows go clockwise around the blue faces and counterclockwise around the red faces. So this happens for all quivers. They are The faces are colored in blue and red, not in some arbitrary way, but in such a way that the, the arrows go clockwise around the blue and counterclockwise around the red. Now, this is the quiver on the torus. Um, a more important role in this talk would be played by the, the lift of the quiver to the universal cover. So this is going to be Q tilde. It's going to be the same quiver, but drawn periodically on the plane. So this is how it looks like in the case of C3. Lots of blue, lots of red, and you know these three types of edges. A slightly more interesting geometry is uh, the suspended pitch. Really. Yes. Right. Why, why and, do you call them red um, it, 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 it just so happens that the quiver on the torus, which arise from this brain tiling procedure, always has this property, uh -huh. this bicolorability with the edges going uh, one way around the blue and the other way around the red. Well, you're going to find out a more important reason, I suppose. <laughs> Okay. 
I'm going to make it even more complicated. I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning time per models only at the very end of this talk. <laughs> Instead of saying what you say. I'm starting to remember, trying to remember the story. I don't remember the book. How do you read out how many nodes the quiver has? What was it over there? We'll tell us in a minute. Not really. <laughs> I mean, no, that picture. Oh, a picture. I mean, these are, a quiver is drawn on a torus, and I'm marking a single node. And the edges are always a straight line between the nodes, but because I'm on the torus, this is an. Oh yeah, yeah. The, the 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 bulleted things here are the vertices of the quiver, but you know they're not drawn perfectly. Uh, this is actually a more interesting geometry. A more, more difficult geometry is called the suspended pinch point. It's given by this equation in C four, and this is the quiver it corresponds to. So the the torus here is this parallel helogram, kind of typically drawn with a three th a three vertices, one, two, and three. But you know these other corners are the same as one four regions, one, two, three, and four, and seven edges. So three minus seven plus four is, is again zero. And this is the periodic lift of this quiver. So essentially the, uh, what's it like? The, this is the fundamental domain right here, this parallelogram. Anyway, I think it's a, it's a nicer picture. The point is, if I get to it, hopefully, the, the actual combinatorics, Underlying the dimer models here is going to happen on this quiver. Dimer model is is what people call the dual of this quiver, the, the periodic quiver. Anyway, so these are this is as much as I can say about a transition from a toric labial threefold X to a quiver, and pretty much this whole talk will be combinatorial and will be about the quiver. So I'm afraid I probably won't speak, be saying any more about that and and just focusing on the quiver. All right, so what the, how does I set up here? The uh, set up from my, from my interest actually started a few years ago when Lee and Yamazaki, they associated a certain Yangian, uh, a certain algebra that can be interpreted as a Yangian. So they associated a Yangian to Q and this Yangian acts on the vector space of BPS states. In this language, it's, it's the, a vector space of crystal configuration. So which acts on vector space of crystal configurations. So this is like a combinatorial model for counting BPS states. Configurations. So this is you know, the starting point of, this, of the representation theory Behind this, I will not be interested in this Yangian, and instead I will be interested in the Q version of this thing, which was introduced maybe like a couple of years ago by Kalahov Li Yamazaki, and at the same time by Hoshita and Watanabe. So they are the ones who introduced the object I'm actually going to be studying in this talk. So they define something which they call a quantum quantum colloidal algebra, but I'm going to call a quantum loop algebra for selfish reasons. Quantum loop algebra. And this quantum loop algebra, I will denote by U tilde plus. This quantum loop algebra U tilde plus, just like in the Yangian case, it acts on the vector space whose basis is given by crystal configurations. So this is the vector space with a, a basis indexed by crystal configurations. And now I have written a ton of things on the board in this formula, and I have to explain to you what all of these things mean. But before doing so, I'll point out that this is the, you know, the main fundamental, fundamental equation of this talk. And I'm going to have to take like 10 or 15 minutes to explain what all of the characters are in this, in this green box. But you know, morally speaking, this is an algebra which acts on this vector space, and this is what I, as a representation theorist, am studying. Okay, so this has kind of been my introduction, my historical and general introduction, and now I'm going to define these objects. The easiest thing to define is what F is. F is going to be the ground field of everything this, that this talk will be about. It'll be the field of rational functions in two variables, Q1 and Q2, and here, Q1 and Q2 can be interpreted geometrically as equivalent parameters of, well, characters, really, 
say, characters of the Calabi Yaut chorus. Let me say a couple of words on, on what the Calabi Yaut chorus is. So we are working on a toric Calabi Yaut threefold by virtue of it being toric. It means that it has a rank three torus C star cube acting on X. But this isomorphism here is not invariant with respect to this torus. That this torus acts by the trivial character here and it acts by a non trivial character here. Instead, we are going to replace the Calabi L3 torus to, to the, the kernel of the character by which it, had, it acts here. We get a Calabi L2 torus, but with respect to which this is actually an invariant isomorphism. So the Calabi L2 torus is you know, a rank two torus with respect to which this isomorphism is invariant. Namely, the torus you know, preserves this isomorphism. And Q1 and Q2 are just going to be the elementary characters of this rank two torus, and everything will happen over this field of rational functions in Q1 and Q2. They are the basic parameters of a theory. For those of you who like McDonald polynomials, Q1 and Q2 are Q and T. Yeah. Okay, that was maybe the easiest thing I can explain in this picture. Uh, the next one doesn't even appear in this picture. So, ah. Let's introduce some, uh, some notation. Let's write I for the vertices of Q. This is gonna show up repeatedly and E for the edges of Q. So for every edge, so for all E in E, one has a distinguished parameter in F. So let's call it TE in F dual. Uh, these can be quite generic in my picture. I mean, from a theory that there are actually certain monomials in Q1 and Q3. So there's a rule by which they are defined. But for my high purposes, these can be pretty much any elements of any non zero elements of this ground field, which satisfy this very the, the following very important constraint. So I do need these to satisfy the loop constraint. And the loop constraint is the fact that whenever you take the product of the edges around any face, so remember that this quiver has you know, a bunch of faces. If you take the product of the TEs around any face, you should get one. So that is what people know as, as a loop constraint. But out of this loop constraint, we have a parameter for every edge of the quiver, and then we can assemble them in the following rational functions. So these rational functions are going to be called zeta ijx, and they are simply encoded by pairs of vertices. So this is for all i and j vertices of the quiver. And the rational function is basically product over all edges from i to j, one minus x t e, and here you might have a factor of one minus six in the denominator if i is the same as j. So what's going on here? The point is this particular rational function encodes all of the TEs corresponding to all of the edges between i and j. And I'm saying all of the edges between i and j because you're on a torus, you might have multiple edges between two vertices like we saw in the, the, the C3 example, you have a single vertex with three, uh, three loops. So in the case of C3, you have a single vertex, so the only such rational function would be zeta 1, 1, and it's 1 minus x t1, 1 minus x t2, 1 minus x t3 divided by 1 minus x. So this is like the rational function which encodes all of these edge parameters. And it's going to play a very important role in what follows. Well, now it's finally time for me to define what the, uh, uh, the quantum loop algebra is. So the quantum loop algebra is very explicitly defined as the following F algebra. So it is the F algebra generated by symbols called EID. So here I goes over the, the vertices of the quiver and D goes over all of the integers. It's called a loop algebra because of the presence of this D here. And we impose the following relation. So 
this is a standard relation which one sees in, in quantum hoop algebras. So here, EI of Z is called the generating current of the EIDs, and it is defined as the sum over all D from negative infinity to positive infinity, EI comma D divided by Z to the power. So what is the meaning of this thing? Well, this thing is a form of a series whose coefficients are the generators of the algebra. This here is an equality of formal series in Z and W, and the coefficients of this equality are given in terms of this very special Horam polynomial here, essentially. How do you turn this thing into, into equations? You take this equality of formal series in Z and W, you, you extract the coefficient of any z to the k w to the l in both sides, and then you just get a linear combination of products of eid and ejk. And those linear combinations are going to be the relations in your algebra. So in other words, this algebra has countably many generators, a z family of generators for every vertex of the quiver, modulo a bunch of quadratic relations. And this is how it's defined. It's called a, a quantum loop algebra because, you know, it, it really looks a lot like a Dreamfeld representation of quantum affine algebra. And um, the only other thing I probably should mention is that I'm calling this a quantum loop algebra, but what people actually call the quantum loop algebra is the double of this thing. So quantum algebras in general have, have generators E, F, and H. I'm only giving you the E's here. And the reason for that is because once you know the E's, there's a general procedure to get the F's and the H's and to, and, and to create the entire quantum loop algebra. So even though I, I'm only giving you the positive half of the quantum loop algebra, I'm going to call this the quantum loop algebra because it encodes all of the information and I don't want to keep you here for three hours. So that's why. Any questions? That's a zeta. So zeta eij is a particular polynomial, polynomial in quotes because it might have a, a denominator, but it's essentially a polynomial whose zeros keep track of the edge parameters. So you can think of it a, as like a way to encode all of the edge parameters for the edges going between i and j. Okay. Because otherwise I would have to multiply everything by a product of of Z minus W, so it's not important. It's not an essential restriction. It's like, um, it's customary. So the only other thing I have to, to tell you about is probably the most involved thing in this, what is a crystal configuration, but this is going to be significantly more involved than anything which is on the board so far. So if anyone has questions about, you know, what happened so far and how would be a good time. Yeah. Is it the, the, the writing of the theory of the quiver? What's that? The, the things defined from the quiver field are, are, are the only Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the quiver is only associated to Tori Calabi of three folds X. So it, all, it only corresponds to toric things. More generally, you could probably say everything that I'm about to say for more, more general class of quivers than those which come from from toric X's, but you know, the motivation is for quivers which come from toric X's by this procedure that I haven't told you what it is and that Andre expressed in a few words. No. <laughs> I was still sweeping stuff under the rug, so. If you did that construction for a Dinkin quiver, you would almost get that. You would get like a pre quotient of that because I so far have not imposed a set relations, a three first set relation. Uh, I have not done so yet. So that, that'll actually be the most technically challenging part of the talk. So that thing is like the quantum affine algebra for a Dinkin quiver, but without the a set relations. I think it was inspired by that. I mean, it's not mine, it's, it's these people's. Like yeah, yeah. So I, 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 to be honest, I, I I'm not. Yeah. 
here is going to add, I mean, every single spot is the same as every other spot. These are so they were all the same. Here they're not. They're, they're, there's no different crystal size and no non the crystal that have color. And there's like one of them. Um well they're not they're not all orbital, but yeah, if you did see if you did see if you did all nine three of two, you'd get the orbital of which you know exactly. If you just like a, just a good number of the position in the model, don't you get the same thing in a lot of pictures if you take them and then you do it? Uh, no, that's what makes me sorry. Uh, but for example, the dependent field point, I don't think it's an orbital way. So it, it wouldn't come from that. It would... Look, all I can say is the people who Came, came up with this Yang and so on. They, they cite your paper with Nikita from a number of years ago as introducing crystal configurations. But I, I don't know if, if literally what they call crystal configurations are the same as yours or just inspired by them. And I'm not so sure. Anyway. All right. So this is all history. Yeah. So I'm about to say, you know, with a certain degree of vagueness, because once again, <laughs> I want to finish in a, in a reasonable amount of time. So, so, okay. so, so you mentioned it didn't start with the important cat fuel. It was giving me some of that for the feeling by the hour. The fan gives rise to the brain tiling. The brain tiling gives rise. Well, it's an intermediate step between the fan and the quiver. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I, if I would have have prepared this picture, I could show it to you. But since I haven't, my, I mean, it's probably a better idea not to. This is, I've worked it out. A crystal configuration is, and this is not a definition, it's just exp explaining what kind of thing a crystal configuration is. It is a certain subset of so-called atoms. People call them atoms, I have no idea. That's a, a right way of thinking about them, but the people whose papers I've been reading call them atoms. So these atoms are points of Q tilde times Z. So I, I will explain the role of the Z in a bit. But it's a subset of atoms with a bunch of properties. And, and the most important properties of these atoms, so these are, are going to be denoted by I in a box. Essentially, I keeps, keeps track of the projection of this atom from Q tilde times Z to Q tilde and then to Q. Remember that Q tilde is the universal cover of Q. So by taking an atom, you forget a lot of stuff. You can get a, a vertex in Q, and that's why we denote them by I in a box. These atoms have, among other things, the following is the, the, the crucial property of these things. So if there exists an edge between two atoms, and J is in the crystal configuration, then I is in the crystal configuration. Well, I'll explain in a second what this has to do with plane partitions and examples that, that people are, are maybe a bit more familiar with. But first of all, I have to explain to you what exactly is, has it mean to have an edge in Q tilde times Z? So we know that Q tilde is a quiver. So what about the, his Q tilde times Z? So Q tilde times Z, it's actually quite interesting. So it's a certain lift of Q tilde. And here is a prescription for defining this lift, but the, the, the essential feature is that if you go around the face in Q, so going around any face in Q tilde, remember that the faces of Q tilde are just like the lifts of the faces of Q to the universal cover, and their boundaries are cycles in Q tilde, going around the face takes you to your starting point because it's a cycle. But in Q tilde times Z, this takes you from I comma K. So from a vertex I comma K to I comma K plus one. So essentially this thing is a lift of Q tilde where you have, where you have broken all of the, the cycles. There are no oriented cycles anymore by saying that Whereas you had a cycle coming back to the same point initially, now it's going to spiral up and end up one level higher. And there's a, an actual description for doing this, but I don't want to dwell on this too much. I'll give you an example in a bit. Hmm? Okay. 
<laughs> yeah. All right. So, <laughs> for those of you who don't know that thing, I'll just give you an example. So, when X is C3, when X is C3, then crystal configurations are the same as 3D partitions or Another way of saying it is plane partitions. And I'll show you how this looks like. So what's, what's, what, what is Q tilde in the case of X is equal to C3? Well, in the case of X is equal to, to C3, you can see that Q tilde is associated, is identified with the lattice in Z2. It's a two-dimensional lattice. So Q tilde times Z is the lattice in, in Z3, the standard lattice in Z3. And the edges in this standard lattice in Z3, so in Q tilde times Z, the edges look like this. So you have the horizontal edges, you have the vertical edges, and they, um, you know, right and up is a direction of Q tilde, which is Z2, and Z3 is going to be out of the board. So now this edge keeps you in at the same height. This edge keeps you on the same height, but the, the, the third edge is going to give you one height out of the board. So if I follow with one more edge, I will not end up at this exact same box, but at this box, you know, one, one level closer to us. So, you know. I was just saying, so this um, that is really, I mean, you see the projection to get to you that the is putting it back. Yep, that's one way of saying it. And if you will allow me to call this a lattice, then I can also apply a transformation of this lattice in which I take the height K plane in this space and I shift it by the vector KK in the, in the direction of the board. And if I do that, these three edges are going to take the following shape. The, the right going one will stay the same. The top going one will stay the same. But if I apply this shearing, then this uh, southwest pointing one is actually going to point right out of the board. So one step out of the board. So it, this is the edge one, two, three. Before this shearing, after you do this linear transformation, which I'm calling a, a shearing, the arrows are, the first arrow is move one step right. Second arrow is move one step up. Third arrow is move one step out of the board. So if you apply this linear transformation, let's see what it means to have the, this condition here. A subset of atoms in Z3, in other words, a subset of lattice points in Z3, with the property that if a certain a box is in your subset, then its leftmost neighbor is, its downmost neighbor is, and its into the boardmost neighbor is also in the subset, that's the same as a plane partition, because a plane partition is a, a collection of boxes in the corner of the, you know, of an octant in, in, in Z3 with the property that it is preserved by these three moves. So going left, going down, and going into the board. This has not been a complete definition of a crystal configuration because a crystal configuration encodes some more information than this. It encodes something known as a framing, which is exactly in the language of plane partitions, it's exactly what forces a plane partition to be inside an octant as opposed from being inside the entire Z3. But the gist of the construction is a set of boxes with this property that plane partitions enjoy. If a box is in your set, then so are all of its, all of its backwards neighbors, so to say. Anyway, I hope I can convey a little bit of intuition here and to see how how plane, and to show you how plane partitions fit into this picture. But I'm not going to try to be much more specific than this. Any questions about the intuition? Once again, it's not a full definition. That's not what I'd like to focus on. All right. So now, finally, we have like an understanding of what's in this green box. So we know more or less, at least intuitively, what, what indexes a basis of this vector space. And we know that there is an action of this algebra on it. And right now I'd like to show you how this, how this action looks like explicitly. So before I do that, I just need one more thing. I need to say that 
for any uh, crystal configuration lambda, uh, every atom of lambda, so every atom I of lambda has a weight. So this weight is going to be denoted by chi with an I here. And this is an element of the ground field in time zero. This is defined by the rule that chi j divided by chi i is te, the edge parameter corresponding to the edge e. If the edge, if there's an edge between i and j corresponding to, well, if there's an edge e between these two, two vertices of q tilde, essentially. Now, I think which I wrote over here only only defines the weight up to constant multiple. The normalization is given by a certain, a certain a root of the crystal configuration, which is part of the uh, datum. And I didn't tell you what it was, but it plays the exact same role as the box in a plane partition, which is at the corner. It has like the root and there is a generalization of this notion for a crystal configuration. And it allows you to unambiguously find these weights and not just up to constant multiple as I have done so here. But the only things that we will need to write down the action essentially are these uh, are these weights. All right. So what is the action? Well, I have a, an explicit Hector space with an explicit basis and an algebra with an explicit set of generators. So I'm going to show you explicit matrix coefficients for these generators in this basis. So if I take EID and I act with it on a crystal configuration lambda, the answer is going to be a sum over all crystal configurations obtained by adding an atom I to lambda. I'm going to put here lambda prime, and already what I'm writing here is non-trivial. So what, what this means is sum over all ways to add to lambda an atom, meaning a point in Q tilde time z, which, which projects to i in Q. So sum over all those ways with the condition that a resulting set is also a crystal configuration. And if you think about a plane partitions, if you have a plane partition, a 3D partition. I, if, you, if you're more familiar with the term 3D partition, it's the same thing. If you have a 3D partition, there are only finitely many ways to add a box to a 3D partition and get a valid 3D partition. You can only add the box in the corners of the 3D partition. You can't just add it everywhere. The result will not be a 3D partition. So this here, even though a priori it might look like an infinite sum, it's actually a finite sum if you want this thing to be a well-defined crystal configuration. All right, so now there's going to be a coefficient. Yeah. Um, that's the point you had in the original case. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Oh, oh the, the product of T's is always equal to one. And in Q tilde and also in Q tilde times Z. So even if you go to three dimensions, you only have like a like two independent uh, parameters. So even if even if these three D partitions live in three D, you only have two independent parameters. All right. So now there's going to be a coefficient here, which I'm going to to call this sum coefficient. And that's going to be very important. And then. You also have to multiply with the weight of the box you add. So essentially, to, to write down this action, EID acting on a crystal configuration is a sum over all ways to add a box to that crystal configuration, some boring coefficient, which I'm not going to write down. And D only appears here in the dth power of the weight. Well, right now it doesn't really mean anything except that it's an explicit formula that most people have wrote down. But I'll show in the following formula, they will have an important property. I shouldn't say boring. I should say uncontroversial. It's something that people know how to write down and there's a standard way of doing so. We we'll have like an adjoint type of coefficient. Yeah, they're going to be a joint with respect to some kind of inner product. I think so, but I, I, I have never checked. So I don't know. But it kind of sounds like that, yeah. It seems like that. I, 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 I mean, I shouldn't be so sure because their coefficients actually do depend on a way to, to cut your plane partition first horizontally, which we do here, but then also along the other two dimensions. 
So they do make some choices over there, which I don't see in this, in this uh, quiver quantum toroidal stuff. So I, I can't say that it's literally going to be the same coefficient, but it might just be the same coefficient in a, in a different normalization. Yeah, yeah, algebraic isomorphic. Well, yeah, but you can always renormalize the basis. So I mean, I'm not. So that, that's why I'm hesitant in saying that it's literally the same formula as what these people wrote. Maybe, maybe it's like some, yeah, some, some change of basis. All right. So you have this thing, and now the the formula I want to, you know, to annoy you with now is when you take a composition of n such operators and let's see what happens. So if a single operator added a single a box for crystal configuration, then n operators is going to add n boxes. So lambda is equal to lambda prime plus, you know, a box corresponding to I1 plus a box corresponding to IN. Here you're going to have lambda prime. Here you're going to have, are going to have another coefficient. I'm going to call this some coefficient, and I'm going to claim it's non controversial. But the, the part which is going to be a little bit more discerning is the following expression. So take the first weight, the weight of the first added box and raise it to the d1 power, take the weight of the nth added box and raise it to the dn power, and then you will see this product of zeta functions appearing. So now you're going to have some bilinear terms, which are like this zeta function zeta of u or whatever, i u i v, i box i u divided by i box i v. And this is a big formula, but the, the thing I want to point out here is that this part of the formula is symmetric in the I use. Symmetric in the I use. What do I mean by that? It doesn't really matter in the end if you first add the first box and then the second box, or you first add the second box and then the first box. There is a, a subtlety here in that maybe one of the adding of the boxes is not going to work out, but if that happens, the coefficient is, is going to account for this thing. And so sweeping this subtlety aside, when and saying that when you go from lambda to lambda prime, you add in boxes, it doesn't really depend on the order in which you add them. Yeah, very far away, and then this is true. If they don't interact, then a statement I made is true. This, uh, no. Uncontroversial coefficient is also going to be symmetric in the in the uh, I use. The only time they interact is when one is above another one. Well, you would have to actually see the, the formulas to convince you of, of this, and I'm not going to show you the formulas. Okay. Yeah, it comes from the uh, uh, vanishings of the numerator of this function, essentially. All right, the, the reason why I'm writing it like that is because I want to isolate the only part of this formula where the order of the of the boxes you add appears. It only appears in this latter part because this, this product of zeta functions keeps track of the fact that you added the first box first and the second box afterwards because you see zeta one, two here and not zeta two, one. So this last part of the expression is the non-symmetric one. And I'm pointing this out because the next idea is in a certain sense to sum over all possible ways to add a boxes. I mean, nothing if you symmetrize the right-hand side and nothing happens to the sum because it's already symmetric, nothing happens to this gamma because it's already symmetric, but this product of zetas and products of weights here is going to be replaced by its symmetrization. So this is the moral idea which leads into the a definition I'd like to give you now, namely that of the shuffle algebra. Whoops. So this whole business about you know the asymmetry of the i mu's, uh, namely the fact that you add i one first and i two second and so on, can be 
systematically made sense of by the following notion, the notion of a shuffle algebra, and I'm going to define this for you. These are, you know, the second indices of these E's. So the generators of this algebra are EID and D is an integer. If, you, if one is used to, to regular quantum term groups, quantum groups only have generators EI, but these are quantum loop groups. So they have EI0, EI1, EI2, EI3, and so on for every I, and with negatives as well. All right, definition, a shuffle algebra. It's, uh, what I'm about to define now is something that people call the big shuffle algebra sometimes. This thing is a very big vector space. So it's to be namely the direct sum over all ways to choose non-negative integers in I. And essentially what you have here is an I tuple. Remember that I is the set of vertices of the quiver. This is an I tuple of uh, on negative integers. And for any such I tuple, I'm going to put here a big polynomial ring. So polynomials in these variables, and Horam polynomials, I guess. And there's as many of them as prescribed by these ends. So the thing I want to point about these variables is that they have two indices. The first index is always a color, namely a vertex in the quiver, I. The second index is a natural number, one, two, three, four, and so on, as many of them as this prescribed number in here. So if you think about it, there is going to be a, a direct sum and here with no variables, that's F, and then there's gonna be a bunch of direct sum ends of polynomials in one variable, then two variables, three variables, and countably many direct sum ends increasing like that. The sim here refers to the fact that these uh, polynomials have to be symmetric in ZI1, ZI2, ZI3, dot, 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 for each I separately. There is no interaction between ZI1 and ZJ1, if I is different from J. There's only symmetry involving I1, I2, I3, and so on. Oh, anyway, I'm calling this a shuffle algebra, but all I'm doing is giving you a vector space. Uh, the multiplication in this vector space is not the one you would expect. I mean, it's polynomial ring. You would say maybe you can multiply inside the polynomial ring, but the multiplication here actually involves multiplying stuff which comes from different uh, polynomial rings. So the multiplication is the following. If you take a polynomial in variable ZIA, the shuffle multiplication of this thing with a polynomial in variable ZJB is going to be the following expression. You write your first polynomial in one set of variables, your second polynomial in another set of variables, then you multiply by a ton of these zeta functions. So of overall i, j, a, and b, zeta functions, zeta i, j, z, i, a divided by z, j, b, and you symmetrize. Or symmetrize means that you sum over all ways to permute z, a, 1, z, a, 2, z, a, 3, and so on. And I think I want to stress here is that if this is a, a polynomial in n i variables for every i, and if this is a polynomial in n i prime variables, this definition is set up so that the right hand side is a polynomial in n i plus n i prime variables. So, in other words, the set of variables z i a and z j b are disjoint in the right hand side, so that you have something in as many variables in the right hand side as the total number of variables here and here. So this is an associative multiplication on that big vector space V, and this is what people call the big shuffle algebra. I, why do we define this? Well, it's actually not, maybe not so hard to believe by staring at these formulas. Well, uh, the, the formulas on top that there exists an action uh, psi of this algebra on the, you know, the a VPS vector space, which we consider. So the direct sum of crystal configurations. So this thing acts on moduli space, uh, the, the vector space of crystal configurations. And the formula by which it acts is the following. If I take a polynomial, which is, you know, an element of V, elements of V, remember, are, are polynomials in a number of variables. I have to tell you how it acts on a crystal configuration. Well, it's a sum as before over all ways to add a bunch of boxes to this crystal 
configuration and you add as many boxes of color i as you have the variables of color i here so if you have zi1 through zi ni you are going to add ni uh ni boxes of color i to the crystal configuration here you have lambda prime here you have some some non-controversial coefficient as before which i'm not going to write down and then the interesting part is you take this exact same polynomial and you plug in the weights of the boxes you've added. So, you know, leaving aside the issue about this uh, boring factor over here, essentially what this formula is saying is that to act with a polynomial in the shuffle algebra on a crystal configuration, you add boxes to a crystal configuration and the coefficient, the matrix coefficient is exactly R evaluated at the weights of those boxes you've added. So R keeps, keeps, keeps track of the boxes you have added to the crystal configuration lambda to get you the crystal configuration lambda. I'm asking you to, to, to believe essentially that there is a certain condition, uh, uh, a certain choice of constants like this, such that the formula over here gives you an action of V on this vector space, but this fact is kind of built into the a definition of the algebra structure on V. It's defined here how to, to multiply polynomials. The, the scalars in the algebra are just the direct sum and would correspond to all nice being zero. So then essentially here I'm, I'm defining a multiplication on this vector space and I'm claiming that this, this multiplication is an associative product. Okay. Oh no, they're not fixed that. I'm so sorry. No, 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 no. No, no, no. So he's here. You, I mean, if you have, you, yes and no. I mean, in this language, you could, but I would, I would not do that because the right hand side would not be homogeneous in the in I. So let's look back at the the suspended pinch point in which. Uh, the set I had cardinality three, then R is the function in variables uh, Z1A, Z2B, Z3C. This one is a function in Z1A prime, Z2B prime, Z3C prime. And the right hand side is also a function in Z1, Z2, Z3 with various second indices. So it, it's a big form. Where's Z? Well, Z are just the arguments of this function, and to, to give you the matrix coefficient of this operator, I have to give you some scalars in the ground field, and I'm saying to get those scalars, you just feed the weights of the boxes you've added in these variables. So the, the operator is somewhere different. If I, if I just combine this one with the half one, I get from the right side. Well, there, there's no Zs in the right-hand side, though. No, because there isn't. Up there, that's like the, the actual like gradient. But in E of Z, oh, that Z. Yeah, I mean, his form, it's a different Z. Sorry, his E here is a variable which keeps the, which is like the formal variable that keeps track of all of these EIDs. These Z's here are placeholders for the weights of boxes which you've had. It is the same in a, a delta function sense. <laughs> I'm uh, not completely sure how to deal with the loop parameter in that language. Um, it's the same thing. I mean, I could just see. You could say, well, that's not. Yeah, I mean, in a certain sense. Two, Around, if you that. think about the zeta function as being like the x, the, the x algebra of two simple objects, so if this function zeta ij is like the x algebra of a simple object of color i and the simple object of color j, then yeah, this is exactly what that is. Wow. Yeah, which has to do, which is linear in the boxes you've added and also linear in, in lambda. So, you know. I'm not going to write down these formulas in the talk. They're just 
it's just big, but high, high country is saying they have meaning. All right, so finally, how do we put all of this together? What's the point in defining this big shuffle algebra? Well, if you compare this formula over here with this formula over here, you get an observation which in this context was made by Talaho, Lee, and Yamazaki. They said that the action psi, namely this action down here of the shuffle algebra, no, the action phi, the action up there of the quantum loop group factors through the action psi of the shuffle algebra via the following homomorphism. So basically, there is a homomorphism from u tilde plus to v, and I'm going to call this homomorphism epsilon, and this just sends the generator EID to the polynomial in one variable, zi1 to the power. All right, there's a lot of statements in here. First of all, I claim there's an algebra homomorphism from this algebra to a shuffle algebra given on the generators of u tilde by that formula. Essentially, what you need to do to check that fact is to show that this quadratic relation here holds in the shuffle algebra. And that's in a sense, not maybe not so hard to believe because the structure constants of this relation are, are given by the zetas and the structure constants in the shuffle algebra also have to do with the zetas. They're the same zetas which appear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's zi1 in the direct sum and which corresponds to the, uh, with the ni being 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. And this one is on the i position. So, so in particular, if d is zero, then this corresponds to the function one in a very specific direct sum end of the shuffle algebra. Okay, so what does this mean to us? The purpose of this talk is to understand the action of u tilde plus on this big vector space. However, the fact that this action factors through this homomorphism has a very interesting consequence. There's there are things in the kernel of this homomorphism. And those things are going to act I zero in the vector space we are considering. So the upshot of this is that really U tilde plus is too big to be the right thing which acts on, on the vector space of BPS states. The thing which you actually want to consider is U tilde plus modulo the annihilator of the, of the action, which is none other than the kernel of this homomorphism. So let me write this in words. The goal of this project is to make mathematically precise a thing which I, I just said in words. So the goal is to let to, to understand k plus, which is going to be the kernel of this homomorphism epsilon, to understand s, which is the image of epsilon, and to also and and finally to understand what we can call the reduced quantum loop group which is none other than the thing that was before the quantum loop group modulo this curve. So the reduced quantum loop group is U plus defined by U tilde plus modulo K plus, and you know, by the first isomorphism theorem or whatever this is called, this is isomorphic to S. S, by the way, the image of the homomorphism from U tilde plus to V is called the small shuffle algebra. So the whole V was called the big shuffle algebra. This is called the small shuffle algebra. And this thing in the box is a definition of U plus and the fact that it's isomorphic to the small shuffle algebra is, like I said, the first isomorphism theorem. The motivation of this definition is that this thing now acts on the direct sum of la over lambdas, F times lambda. And it acts so in a faithful way. This action is faithful. Okay, so if the only thing that you care about is the, and this is quite a, quite a niche thing, the action of an algebra on this vector space, then what I'm saying is just kill the kernel K plus because it's useless. It's actually high zero in the representation. And the thing you really should understand is U plus and not U tilde plus. If, if one needs more, um, you know, more motivation for studying this, I, will, I, I can give you examples. So, um, when Q is not one of these Calabial things, but is a dink in quiver, then K 
plus is the ideal generated by the Drinfeld cell relations. So then this U plus is the quantum affine group because I'm imposing the quadratic relations and the Drinfeld cell relations. So U plus is quantum affine group and not U tilde plus. In the Calabi-Yau case, when X is E3, U plus is uh, GL1 hat hat. And when X is the suspended hinge point, U plus is GL2 bar one, the quantum toroidal super, super Lie algebra G21. So these are all call examples. And uh, the examples of GLMN hat hat all fall into this, into his, his picture. But as you take an arbitrary Oracle IBL threefold, then you really get new, uh, new algebras out of this construction. Yeah, I think that would have, that's where the isomorphism between this thing and GL21 had had. Well, okay, so, so these are just examples to show you how these things actually produce known things. And the examples of quantum affine groups GL1 had had, GLM bar N had had, show that that really, if you want to get the correct things, you shouldn't be looking at U plus tilde, you should be looking at, at U plus, at this reduced thing, which is you know, kind of the main motivational aspect of what I'd like to talk about. So this is the goal of this, um, of this talk, really. And I can, um, I can actually give you the main theorem now after a, a very short uh, one hour long introduction, I can finally tell you what the main theorem is. I'm going to erase the definition of the shuffle algebra since we're not going to need it. Well, actually we are going to need it, but unfortunately the middle board is the uh, least favorite board. So here's the main theorem. The, to understand this quantum, this reduced quantum loop group completely, one really has to understand K. Now K plus is the kernel of a homomorphism. It's going to be a two-sided ideals in U, in U plus tilde. Abstractly, it might be a complicated thing. So a thing you want to say is to find a generator for this two-sided idea. Could you just say something? Sure. For you, this is obvious, but for, for, for others who haven't tried the other thing, <laughs> why do we have thought in shuffle algebra? Like why? why is that the right one? Because the shuffle algebra acts, um, acts faithfully on this representation. So to act faithfully on the representation, it means that an, a non-zero element of a shuffle algebra should act by a non-zero non operator on crystal configurations. But in the, in the formula I just so cleverly erased here, the coefficient of an element R in a shuffle algebra is given by taking R and evaluating it at the weights of some boxes in a crystal configuration. It's not so hard to believe from that picture that if the evaluations of R at all collections of weights of all boxes vanishes, then R vanishes. So the action of the shuffle algebra on, uh, on crystal configurations is fake. On the other hand, the action of U tilde is not. So that's why we replace U tilde by the quotient U tilde modulo K. Shuffle, shuffle. Well, the, a, a, a big shuffle also acts, but the thing which is you know the culmination of all of this thing is the action of small shuffle because small shuffle is the one which is isomorphic to this uh, to this reduced quantum loop group. But I mean big shuffle also acts, but small shuffle. Uh, that's exactly what the main theorem would be about. You, I mean the image of uh, of this homomorphism, right? That's exactly what the, the theorem would be about. That's the one which I you know after after an hour of introduction I finally ready. To stay. All right. So if the quiver Q is something which I call shrubby, maybe I'll have time to tell you what this, uh, this technical condition is. It's a technical condition on the quiver Q. Then the two sided ideal K plus is generated. I, I'm giving you an explicit set of generators for this thing. It's generated by one relation. Star per face of the quiver. 
And here's star. That's relation star. So the, that's a, a specific example of relation star for a face which is a triangle. Let me try and unpackage it for a second. So this is a triangular face of this quiver. The vertices are have colors one, one, and two, and the edges between them correspond to the parameters T1, T2, and T3. So we have colors one, one, two here. I'm associating auxiliary variables, alpha, beta, and gamma to these vertices, and I'm writing down the products of series E1 alpha, E1 beta, and E2 gamma in cyclic orders around this, this face. So because my face is a triangle, I have three possible cyclic orders of these, uh, of these series. I have two, one, 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 two, and one, two, one. And all three of these cyclic orders appear in, in this expression. Now, E1 alpha, E1 beta, and E2 gamma are some kind of or form a series in the variables alpha, beta, and gamma. So I multiply them by some polynomials. I divide them by some polynomials. And I say, that's a relation. Can I ask you? So, sure. Uh, the, the starting is uh, this one, so it's a new number, right? Is that one, 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 you know, if you wanted, you could not have imposed any new relations, but then the fact that, you know, a free associative algebra acts on something is completely meaningless. You impose the quadratic relation to begin with, and even, and the fact that this quadratic relation is satisfied in your vector space of crystal configurations is a non-trivial thing. But I'm claiming if you want to understand a totality of relations that hold in the vector space of crystal configurations, then on top of the quadratic relation over there, you also have to understand these relations here. And there's one per face. But the U plus, the, the resulting guy yep. is a familiar object. In, in examples, it gives rise to, to quantum affine groups, quantum toroidal G elements, and so on. Yeah, it's the familiar object. Except if you were to say, look at, presumably you get something new if you, if you were to look at like all my material that you took, you'd get a new quantum. Sure, I'm pretty sure all of these people worked out all of these examples. I personally haven't looked at any examples. I just studied this thing in general. Well, general up to this technical condition of Schrodinger's, which I will, I will get to in a bit. Anyway, a point of, of this project is to actually tell you explicitly what this quotient is and tell you what you have to quotient by. And that's what you have to quotient by. And in general, if your face is a, a polygon with K sides, then you're going to have all cyclic products of all cyclic k-fold products of series. And if you stared at this formula enough, you probably could guess how it has to look like. I don't want to know this. But... Well, it's, it's not exactly the hair relation. Very interestingly, even in the case of the of a Dinkin diagram, these are not the set relations on the nose. The set relations are equivalent to these in, in the sense that I take these things and I'm going to add them some multiples of the quadratic equations, which I already know hold, and then I'm going to get the set relations. So you could say that these things are, are, are equivalent generators of the ideal as the set relations, but they're not the set relations of the nose because there's no, no reason why these relations are canonical. If I take these relations and I add any multiple of these quadratic relations, it's still a valid relation. It's not canonical. This is just like the, the nicest thing I was able to write down, which is saying a lot. <laughs> it's, it's far from nice. Anyway, so I don't want to dwell upon these relations so much other than to say that there's one per face. So it's not that quadratic that Yep. It's the same thing, except, except because the vertices in these faces are one, one, one. Then I'm going to have E1 alpha, E1 beta, E1 gamma, and these will all be zeta one ones. So the indices here come from the colors of the of vertices, essentially. Yep, as many terms as uh, the number of edges in, in the face. If your face is a, a, a heptagon, then it's going to have seven terms. But I haven't worked, I mean, like I, I told me, I haven't worked any more complicated examples by hand other than these, to be honest. I mean, if you do so for a very complicated Calabia threefold with, you know, polygons with lots of vertices, then yeah, this is going to be pretty complicated stuff. Anyway. So you have this relation. And instead of, of proving this fact, actually prove the dual state. So 
What is the person? I don't have a good sense of it. I don't have a good sense in general how to say filter this algebra in a certain way as to as to account for the infinities. I mean, EID goes infinitely in the D in the D positive and D negative direction. If you wanted to gauge the size of it, you would need to filter it appropriately. I mean, other than slope subalgebras, which come you know from the theory of stable envelopes and that kind of stuff, but it doesn't fall into the theory of stable envelopes, so I'm not really sure. Maybe there is something, but I don't know how it would, how it would look like. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, in the examples I, I told you it does, but those are just a few examples that people were able to. Yeah, that's true. Whereas this is, this can be more general. Yeah, but I think in more generality, when you don't, other than this, I don't know how this algebra would look like. And I'm not sure how to answer Andre's question. Okay, uh, you know, the a statement over here, well, if, it, if people are interested and if it's not gonna be too late, sure. I don't know. I don't know if this comes from. I think it started with something else. Maybe something. Right. Okay. Well, no, 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 no. They, 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 they do. What what comes out the first principle calculation of the quality output? I'm Okay, so I'll tell you what, uh, let me tell you what a dual statement to this one is. So, so this statement over here is kind of, is given by some big formulas, which probably don't mean anything to anyone, including myself. Uh, but the dual statement is, is significantly more meaningful. So if Q is shrubby, the dual statement is, uh, I, I will define it in a second, is uh, a characterization of the image of this map. Namely, uh, a dual statement is a characterization of the, sm the small shuffle algebra in the big shuffle algebra. So if Q is shrubby, then you can say exactly what S is. S is going to be the, the subset of uh, Laurent polynomials in V, which vanish. whenever their variables, whenever the variables of R, variables of R are specialized according to any space. And I'll tell you what this means in a sec. According to any face of Q. So let's take our favorite face, namely a triangle with, uh, you know, one, one, two. So the colors of these vertices were one, one, two, and the equivalent parameters of these edges were T1, T2, and T3. What I will do is I will associate variables in the shuffle algebra to these ones. So this is going to, I'm going to associate the variables Z11 here, Z12 here, and Z21 to this vertex. And saying that, uh, the, that the polynomial R vanishes when the variables are specialized according to this space just means that when you take R and you specialize this variable Z11 to this variable times T1, then this variable to this variable times T2 
And then finally, this variable to this variable times E3, then you get zero. And this now is a condition which anyone can see how to generalize for an arbitrary polygon. If you have a polygon with seven sides here, you're going to have a, a, a condition that this vanishes when you specialize the seven variables where each variable is equal to a T something times the next one. And for this to be well-defined, you need the product of the T's in the phase to be one, which is exactly the loop constraint. All right, so this is, you know, I think kind of unequivocally a much nicer condition than this thing here, than this vanishing star here. Let me call this vanishing two star. And there is a sense in which condition two star is dual to condition star. And in words, uh, this is a feature of the fact that quantum groups in general are both are self-dual. And in, in great generality, quantum groups are, are both isomorphic to shuffle algebras, as you see here in this green box, but they are also dual to shuffle algebras. And this, his, his duality is being invoked in saying that the statement on the top, which is maybe not so easy to fathom, is, is dual to the statement on the bottom, which is a very explicit characterization of the small shuffle algebra inside the big shuffle algebra. All right, so now that I, I told you what the main theorem is, I mean, he tell you what does it mean for a quiver to be shrubby? Exactly. Thank you, Merriam Webster. <laughs> okay, but let me give you a high definition. Sorry, I can actually tell that, uh, you know, there's lots of terminology in my paper, and it all pales into a. Oh, but essentially, I mean, my paper on the subject is essentially a very elaborate Monty Python joke. <laughs> this is all a fraud. But it, anyway, um, Schraub actually does have a, a mathematical meaning, but you know, it has a an intuitive mathematical meaning. But here is a rigorous definition of what it means for Q to be shrubby. So Q is called shrubby if for all pairs of paths, so for all paths P different from P prime in the universal cover, so in Q tilde, with the same, with the same, uh, start and end points. At least one of P and P prime contains a broken wheel. And I'll tell you in a sec what a broken wheel is. That's actually quite easy. So a broken wheel, it refers to the following head up. So imagine a face of the quiver. The face is like this. And imagine that you remove an edge from this face. So the inside of this whole thing is a face. The blue path is called the broken wheel. Because you know it's like a wheel, but you've removed one of its uh, one of its sides. On the other side of this path of this edge you removed, there will be another face with another broken wheel. So over here, you, if this was blue, meaning that the edges go clockwise, here you're gonna have a red one, meaning that the edges go counterclockwise. And the red broken wheel is going to be, co to be called the mirror of, of a blue broken wheel. So this is actually a quite easy geometry, which comes from you know, the specifics of, the, of a quiver. Now, what this condition is saying is that anytime I have a path in Q, in Q tilde and another path between the same endpoints, then at least one of these paths is going to have to contain at some point one of these things where this was an edge and this was a face. This face could be clockwise or counterclockwise, it doesn't matter. Well, if, it, if the path is not, Simple that Henry, you could take the first point when they meet, um, um, and I mean, you could, you could, you could trim down the, these paths, and then you would have 
a pair of simple paths in which one of them would have to contain a broken wheel. So I guess I'm saying it, it, it's enough to state this condition for simple paths, and then it will also hold for non-simple paths. Uh, well, that, that's a particular case of this because you could have the case when one of these paths is empty and the other path is a cycle. And in that case, you, you, are, you are saying that any cycle contains a broken wheel. Yep. Yep. And that thing which goes around being a cycle is going to contain a broken wheel. Oh, fact, oh, I mean, can say it's just, you can have, you can also say that everything. No, no, no. So uh, it contains this thing. Right, but if it also contains the different case, okay. Yeah, it could, sure. Yeah, yeah. So uh, a face contains a broken wheel because, you know, you remove a, an edge and you have a broken wheel. Can you give us examples of servers that are properly invoked? No, I, I, I can't actually. I, I was unable to find a, a single example in the literature of a quiver which comes from this construction, which is in Shrabi. I've looked at a number of examples. I mean, not exhaustively, maybe an example is out there, but I have no idea if they're all shrubby or not. It's, it's strange because I, I, I always thought that this kind of, uh, the simplicity of the process is used here to just uh, the end time of the triangular degree. Just like the model of the process, you can just use the same outside of the end of the world. Okay. And that's uh, that, right? Okay. Right, because it's the same, even the simple triangle is all over. I mean, if you give me a theorem which says exactly what you said, if that's a, it's a fact that all quivers are like quotients of that thing, is it like you say it's a quotient or? And I don't know. And how does this say about the quiver? This would be. Because being a sub. Every one of your atoms is some kind of conglomerate of these quotients. Mm -hmm. I'd have to think about that, but yeah, that might, I mean, maybe you could prove that all of them are shrubby from that. I actually hadn't, had not thought of things in that language. Okay. Um, why, why do you need this to be, to be shrubby? Well, let me give you an example. Yep. Yep. That counts as a P. But I mean, if the thing which if, if the thing which wraps around once contains a broken wheel, then wrapping around more will contain even more broken wheels. All right. So why do we want this uh, shrubbiness properties? So imagine you have a cycle with this is labeled one, two through uh, through k, and h parameters being t one, t two through t k. It's actually a fact that any R which lies in the small shuffle algebra must vanish, must vanish when you specialize its variables according to this cycle. So when you specialize its variables to like ZA is equal to TA times ZA plus one. If you really want to be, you know, we can put here ZA one and ZA plus one one if you want to be, be pedantic, uh, but, it, it, it's not hard to prove this statement. If your quiver was not shrubby, you could imagine that you, you could have a cycle which does not contain any broken wheels. And if this cycle does not contain any broken wheels, the vanishing condition here will not follow from the vanishing, vanishing conditions two star. So if your cycle did not contain any broken wheels, you would have more, more conditions on S than conditions two star over here. And I really want as many conditions as faces because that's what I see in the quotient. So this is one reason why, why shrubbiness is important. The failure of shrubbiness in terms of, of the existence of a cycle with no uh, broken wheels means that these relations would not be enough. And there are more serious failures if, if you have paths, you know, on trivial paths which do not contain such broken wheels, you actually have of vanishings of higher order, which you need to impose, which would not follow from these conditions to start. So the point is that shrubbiness is exactly something which 
which means that relations two star are sufficient to describe the small shuffle algebra inside the big shuffle algebra. So this is like one, one heuristic reason why shrubbiness is important. Can I, can I, yep. So yes, for any cycle whatsoever, R vanishes when you specialize the variables like this. And if this cycle does not contain any broken wheels, there's no reason why this vanishing would follow from those vanishings. So you'd have to add one more vanishing on top of them. And I don't want that. I want as many conditions as spaces. Of the Jacobi algebra or what? I've never thought of things in that language. So I don't know. I, I see what you're saying, but I, I haven't thought of things in that it's language. Kind of, it's, 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 you're kind of building to, uh, to analyze generated information from all the Yeah, but, but, but my goal is to get explicit information. Right. So, so here it's more qualitative. Like you're saying, you're saying it's like whatever, some kind of, you know, second homology. It, it, it's about like a homology of course. It's not with. Yeah, that's true because yeah. these are functions yeah. on a course. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I have general ways to connect, you know, these dual pictures and to think about these relations abstractly, but to get explicit formulas, I need such assumptions like shrubbiness. So, you know, the problem, I, I mean, even if you realize this as, as Hochschild cohomologies of some algebras, computing it explicitly would be the challenge. And this is what I'm interested in. I like high finding explicit generators. Okay, I mean, for those of you who are not, not convinced about the merits of, of a quiver being shrubby. Uh, let me point out that it actually follows from a pre-existing um, consistency condition in the theory of dimer models. So if Q has what is known as an uh, undegenerate R charge, R charge, then Q is shrubby. So having a non-degenerate R charge is a consistency co condition from the theory of Daimler models, and it also appears in, in some versions of gauge theory. Essentially, non-degenerate R charge means that you have a function from the set of edges to the interval 0, 1, such that if you take the sum over all edges around the face, around any face of R of E, you get 2. And if you get the sum, take the sum of all the edges around every vertex, and you sum one minus R of E, you also get two. So this is a consistency condition, which I've seen, like I, like I said, in, in all of these uh, fields, and it implies shrubbiness. I should say, by the way, that uh, the existence of this non-degenerate R charge is equivalent with the uh, with Q can be drawn isoradially. So Q can be drawn isoradially means that you can you can draw it such that all the faces are polygons inscribed in in circles of the same radius. So isoradially means that you know your faces look like this. Essentially, this is maybe not so hard to see because um, the function R of E is telling you exactly what arcs these edges have to subtend. So this is like this and so on. And this appears in the theory of dimer models because the quiver, the fact that you can, can draw the quiver isoradially on the torus means that you can refine this picture to a tiling of the torus with rhombi in the following way, you add vertices corresponding to the centers of these, uh, of, these, of these circles, and you draw all of these edges, and then you just get a bunch of rhombi which are tiling your plane. So this thing is a rhombus. Because all of these circles have the same radius, then you have rhombi, and essentially this gives you a way to cover the, the entire flat torus with rhombi. So the fact that Q can be drawn as written.
So that might be, uh, I mean, this might be the dual quiver. I mean, the, the quiver is a dual of the bipart I grabbed it. There's a notion of isoradial embedding of the bipartite graph and an isoradial embedding of the quiver, and I'm studying the latter. I'm not exactly sure what the weights are in, in, in this context. I'd have to go check this stuff. Okay. So, I mean, that's kind of everything I wanted to say. Mm, sorry, I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> anyway, you know, my interest in this is that that that, that I have I I this proposition shrubbiness is a weaker condition than you know having a a non-degenerate R charge, but you know to ask Arbina's question, I'm not sure if shrubbiness is insured for all of the quivers that come from for of holes. It would be nice, you know, if, if, if the argument you gave worked out, and then, you know, this would describe all of them, really. Because if the quiver is not sh shrubby, unfortunately, uh, the description of this algebra, this double star, is much more complicated. And also, the relations that describe um, the reduced quantum loop groups are much more complicated. So I don't know how to describe them explicitly if you don't have the shrubbiness. Well, let me just say one more thing and then we can be done. So, so where is the term shrubby coming from, actually? A quiver is shrubby if, um, if it behaves nicely with respect to shrubs. So let me tell you what a shrub is. This is like a, a dictionary. <laughs> let me tell you what a shrub is. So before I tell you what a shrub is, I have to We'll tell you what a tree is. Now you all know what a tree is. A tree is something which emanates from a root, and then you know it branches out, it has leaves, and sometimes in April it has flowers as well. So this is a tree. A shrub is a slightly more general version of this. When some of the branches are allowed to meet back, but when they meet back, it's under very, very special conditions. So a shrub is like a tree, but you, you do allow certain kinds of self-intersections, but very, very specific ones. And the actual definition of a shrub is a, a subgraph of Q tilde is a shrub if it contains no cycles, no cycles, and if the shrub contains a broken wheel. Yeah, yeah, because it is like an oriented cycle, but it's not an oriented cycle. And if this contains a broken wheel, it also contains its mirror. It must also contain its mirror. So contain mirror. And <laughs> I'll wait until I introduce the terminology of a dead rat. No, Oka side, uh, shrubs are important for proving this, uh, this statement rigorously, and the property of the quiver being, being shrubby is the fact that shrubs have certain very specific features. So the shrubbiness of a quiver is something which allows me to, to deduce lots of, of properties of a shrub, which is defined as a subgraph of this. 
with this property. And the, the final thing I want to say, and then I will just end, is why are shrubs relevant to you know, quantum groups and shuffle algebras? Well, there is a pairing on this uh, kind of a technical aspect of the proof of the main theorem it has to do with the pairing of the Huffle algebra. This is a non-degenerate pairing. And to compute the pairing of two uh, polynomials R and R prime, this is naturally given by a sum over shrubs, where here you take these polynomials, you multiply them together. So they are you know, polynomials in a bunch of variables. You divide them by some zeta functions. Actually, the division is maybe not so. The zeta functions you divide them by not, not so hard to believe. Zeta i a z j b, but you know I want this to be a pairing, so I want the expression in the right hand side to be a number. And over here I'm writing a rational function for you. The thing you should put here is the residue of this expression corresponding to a shrub s. And essentially, the thing I want to say here is that a shrub is a certain subgraph of call Q in which if I associate variables to the vertices of the shrub, so if this is going to be ZIA and this is going to be associated with the variable ZJB, and then I have a, an edge with parameter T in between them, the residue over here is going to put, take the residue and ZIA is equal to TE times ZJB. Now, if this thing were a tree, then it would be unambiguously how to, to successively find such a radius. Essentially, I would, I would start from the leaves and I would go down and at, at every stage in the tree, I would say the variable from here, take the residue when it's equal to the variable here times some T corresponding to this edge. For a shrub, there's a problem because right here you have a variable and, and it's actually being, being entered in by two branches, then the residue is, is, isn't exactly a simple, simple pole. So you have to be very careful and everything works out essentially because of the properties of the quiver being shrub. So all in all, shrubs are the natural combinatorial structure which encode this very important pairing on the shuffle algebra. And the proof of this theorem is essentially a big, uh, a big algebraic argument involving the existence of this pairing. So that's why shrubs appear. And the quiver, the importance of the quiver being shrubby is that this ensures that the shrubs are well behaved and can be characterized. All right, that's all. Thank you very much. I would say shrubs are inevitable. It, was, it, it would have been a, a great thing if this pairing here would be a sum over trees, but it's not. It's a sum over shrubs. And the problem is that if the quiver is arbitrary, then I can't even say that it's a sum over shrubs. It's going to be a sum over more complicated things where, where the, the branches of the shrub can come together in ways I cannot control. So that would happen for a, an arbitrary quiver. But for a shrub he, he quiver, I can perfectly control the way two or more, more branches meet. So that's why I, I can make sense of the definition of this residue and prove this for me. Yes, Q tilde is the periodic. No, this is finite. I mean, a shrub is a, a finite subgraph, sorry. A finite subgraph of Q tilde. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, not really, no. I mean, uh, it's actually equivalence classes of shrubs up to translation. And it's not even individual shrubs, but it's like, like this joint union of shrubs. The terminology I have for that is a shrubbery, which is where the Monty Python joke comes from. But anyway, so without going into that thing, yeah, it's a sum over equivalence classes of shrubs. Well, it's a pairing, but you want it to be a pairing with some properties. So algebraic properties of, of this pairing is that you want it to be a Hopf pairing. And if you want this to be a Hopf pairing, then you are forced to have that formula over there.
this is a complicated mathematical statement. It's not immediately visible. But okay, so that formula is forced upon you. Existence of the, I mean, if the pairing exists, it has to be unique by the hope property, but it's not even guaranteed. And I can only, I can only show it exists. I construct one assuming the quiver is shrubby and as a sum over equivalence classes of shrubs. You know. Where we explain how so these kinds of ETSA counts are known for long. For, for yeah, the counts have been taken in. Yeah. The pieces are in fact drying, so drying earlier drying. Anyway, so he explained how to do ETS counts that were not known, that I knew in his work, but on the same page. Mm -hmm. uh, so these correspond to the frame quivers on your. Yes, so yeah, yeah. Sorry, that they're bounded if you take the two for them. Mm -hmm. He explains how to do the counts to the non equivalent. And uh, in that setting, so it's also true that uh, there, if you, there's some certain stability conditions here. Yes. Which, if you vary it, the whole story disappears. Like it, it assumes, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Bound state with the big spread goes away if you vary it. Yeah. So it has to be that the same point of should act also on his. So, you know, and I said a, a BPS vector space. There's not a single one of them. There's as many of them as you have same in conditions. So the, yeah. there are many, many representations of one and the same algebra depending on framings. Now with the stability, I haven't actually seen if in these more recent papers, they actually impose a certain stability condition or if it can be arbitrary. Oh, no, no, it's very, the, I, I, It should probably be a very special one. It's just very one parameter. Yeah. Okay, which makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it also so happens that the yeah. Nakajima quiver variety picture. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I don't think this thing holds in that generality, but for a specific uh, stability parameter when they can construct their Yangian and so on, then this thing applies. No, but it should still be true. I mean, of course, if you construct this action, it's going to be a different. I, don't know I mean, the quantum different group different can different be different. described abstractly, but if you wanted to act on one of these vector spaces, then yeah. um, my hunch is that you would need a, a specific stability condition. So, uh, I mean, that, that, and yet, the quantum group that does act is some very universal thing okay. with is associated with the And I think you would think that you could act on. On the state of any that you get on the audio. And in particular, it should act on the on the on the state that that was over, which differ from these by well, this is a path algebra of the quiver with but one frame. Mm -hmm. These are VPS states of the same quiver without a frame. So there's a one frame, which are much harder to count. Okay. Um, and it should act. And so I don't know how hard it's going to be to construct it. Actually. The framing is not what worries me, but stability conditions might be if your stability condition is such that it throws out some some crystal configurations. No, no, no. So, so it's not that that kind of stuff. The same quiver, the, the same basic quiver. Okay. As, um, uh, well, sorry, there's a point in the parameter space of trim here where you get the same basic quiver for the if you do, except there's no framing. The okay. Framing does not sure. Yeah, like zero, two, or four, and I don't know, the four, six, and I don't know. She has one system of that. She's all right, so the thing is, yeah. I mean, but Hada just saying that you have a more complicated sheaf and.